I, I, I read through it, but uh, I, I haven't pinned anything down as far as that. But, no, because it very well can be the track. I mean, it could very well can be seen. But, yeah. but we do know that that is a confederacy. They say, I saw a beast come out of the land. Land always Israel. So that's a false prophet that comes out of Israel and, and all of this type of thing. Yeah. But I uh, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? If not, we're going to move on to evangelism again. And uh, okay, let's move on. The key question in Christianity. The key key question in Christianity is yeah, why the cross? Why the cross? That's the key. Question in Christianity. And we can move from 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 from, from uh, this key this key question. If, uh, if we can answer answer this question by the cross, then we can know uh, <coughs> what what we need to know. We can gain a wealth of knowledge concerning God, His love. Uh, God is dealing with mankind, where we come from, where we're headed, uh, what was the interruption, uh, what caused the interruption in uh, the fellowship between Adam and God, and, and on and on and on. So, why the cross? Got it? You're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. You bless every point there. Because if you want to concentrate on the cross, Christianity could have used any symbol. Could have used the manger when Christ was born, but they chose not to. They could have used the, 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 the carpenter uh, 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 building where Jesus grew up as a carpenter, but they did. They could have used the dove, an emblem of peace, quietness, and but they did. They could have used. The, uh, uh, any, any symbol other than the cross, but it chose the cross. And the cross represented the worst kind of death that a human could ever experience. The cross was shamefully looked upon. The cross was considered ignominia. Cicero, Cicero the Roman emperor said that the cross, the cross was a Cruel and disgusting punishment. Excruciating. Uh -huh. The cross, according to the Jews, the cross, uh, 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 cursed was everyone, anyone who died on the cross. If a person died on the cross, they were cursed according to Deuteronomy. They were forsaken. They were suspended between the heavens and the earth as if they weren't fit for heaven and they had no place left in the earth. That's, that's what the cross represents. Curse is everyone that dies on the cross. And that's why Paul said that the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews. And, and they, couldn't get, they couldn't get beyond that. How in the world are our Messiah, the one who would come and, and, and liberate us from uh, a Roman yoke and, 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 and uh, re recreate or restructure, recreate and bring back in the glory days of Solomon and David. And you're telling me that he's a Messiah? Under, that's why the Jews couldn't accept that. Come on. Because the Jew, according to Jew, in, uh, in that Messianic prophecy, according to the, uh, the, the prophet, as well as the Messianic prophecy in Psalm, the Jews understood that the Messiah would come and reign. The Messiah would come and set up his kingdom. He would reign, and all the enemies were going to be put on his feet. That's what they were looking for. But yet they understood what Isaiah said, that uh, 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 unto us a child is born, unto us a son. Not so much that scripture, but the 53rd after uh, Isaiah, he was wounded for our transgression, the roof for our iniquity, just out of our peace was upon him with his right, we are here. And so they couldn't reconcile a dying Messiah on the cross with a random messianic song about the Messiah who's going to reign. So what they did, they, they said, evidently that's going to be two Messiahs. 
one who's going to suffer, one who's going to reign. And yet, with all of this confusion, and, and the cross was foolishness to the Greek because the Greek was highly intelligent folk, and unless it was sophisticated, and, and, uh, and, and unless the message was intellectual lies, no way could they accept the cross. Jews said, that's, that's stupid, that's stupid, that's crazy. I don't know. Jews what? not Jews, uh, Greek, Greek. Greek was all uh, over how many angels can stand on the head of a pin, of a needle. And they were all about why is why, why is why, why is why, why is good, good is good because God is damn is good, but good, no, God is damn is good because of the quality and the essential that was all involved. And so they, they, they were why, and dying on the cross to save the world, foolishness, foolishness. But then so we're here to answer why the cross, okay? Okay, let's, let's move on. Do we have any questions from that? First of all, yes, no. What is more important, Jesus dying on the cross or the resurrection, right? Yeah, they both are equally important. Because he, by his death, he paid the price for our sins. By his resurrection, he gives us life. Right? You see, because if he would have died on the, died on the and saved the grave, then it would make him no different than any other. Our sin, like it, our sin would be forgiven. Let's say he died on the cross. Okay, fine. He died on the cross. Then your sins are forgiven. Praise God. Hallelujah. But after that, we still left to, to deal in this world and to contend with the forces of evil in our own strength. It's not enough to die and forgive and set me free from sin. Or set me free. When, when, when I got to live in this old mean world, I did a power, so his resurrection gives us power, gives us life. So they both are equally important for me. Go to the cross because without the cross, without his dying, there could be no resurrection. In Christianity, is why the cross? Why the cross? Okay, let's move on to the next. We're going to show first of all the cross confirms the biblical teaching of the total depravity of humans. Why the cross? The cross confirms. The cross gives evidence that the Bible is right when it says man is. We are totally depraved. Now the question is what meant by totally free. Because as those who deny total depravity. The cross confirmed the biblical teaching of the total depravity of, of human. When Adam sinned, everything about man was affected negatively. His emotions were affected. His heart, his mind, his intellect, everything. Uh, when we say total depravity, we mean that there is nothing, remember Paul, uh, there is nothing good in me, there is no good thing in me. It means that everything about us is, is out of whack. Our intellect, we, 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 we limited in our knowledge and our understanding. We limited in the way we comprehend that. There are six different ways which you can take a stick. And so then, we are limited in our intellect. We are limited in our emotions. Our emotions are messed up. We have a way of, 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 of uh, glory in that which is wrong. And sometimes, uh, uh, I'm trying to find the right word. Sometimes we go in the wrong and we elevate, I'm sorry, and we diminish the right. Y'all don't know what I'm saying. Amen. Folks that talk about the pastor or any a Christian who's trying to help mm -hmm. the community, trying to help them 
in their living and kind of help them in their relationship. If they take what he teaches and preach, they can strengthen their family, they can strengthen their children, they can strengthen their religion, and then all he's trying to do is put them in a path where God is blessing. And they'll talk negatively. But the dope fella, the pusher, the seller, be on the corner, right around the street, right across from that, that house, and they never say a word. They won't turn him in. And he is destroying young lives, middle-aged lives, old-aged lives, but they won't. We put down on people who represent that which is positive. And we elevate, in many cases, those who represent destruction. Am I helping somebody? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 something wrong with our emotion. Something, listen, something wrong with our desire. We desire the wrong thing. You know, we talk generally this week. We desire the wrong thing. We desire that which will satisfy the flesh which is only temporary. And we despise and ignore those things that are of eternal value. That's why folks are not here tonight. Because they make light of and do not take seriously the word of God, learning the word of God, that word that can, Psalm says, he sent his word in you. That word that will never come back void. That word that Jesus said, man shall not live by bread, but by every word. That, that's the word. That's the word that addressed our, our lives, addressed every aspect of our lives. That word tells us how to uh, uh, live in harmony. It tells us how to relate to one another. It tells us how to deal with those who are opposed us. Uh, it holds us. It tells us that word tells us how to deal with our enemies. That word tells us how to be blessed. That word tells us how to have peace. That word tells us how to have assurance of salvation. That word tells us how to have power in our lives. That word tells us how we can stand against the storms of life. That word and that and they neglect that word. To watch something on television that's not going to do anything positive for that. I can't be able to tell them. Yes, yes, all right. All right. And so, uh, uh, totally proper to me that uh, our desires are out of whack. We desire the wrong thing. Our hearts are out of whack. The center of our desires and decision making process. We choose the wrong thing. We make decisions that not only affect us negatively, but they affect our families negatively. We make the decision to buy up things and stuff for our children and to send them to the best school that we can and to do all that we can to, uh, for, for, to help them acquire some status in society and spend little time teaching them the word of God. That will make them wise. And it enabled them to know how to make decisions, how to choose friends, what to look for, things of value. Somebody ought to help me out here. Stop things of value. We don't teach them the things of value. We don't teach, we don't lead and teach them and hold them to the word of God so that they can grow up with a worldly value system. Yes, yes. <laughs> totally property. Messed up. You know, when we think messed up in our desires, our decision making, we're messed up. We're messed up in our goals and motives, and even our physical, our goals and motives. Total depravity. Our goals. It said the goal. Man, I told you before, Dan said that the worst thing can happen to a person is that they set goals for themselves and have dreams and live all the time. All, all their life and never reach their goal, never accomplish that dream. And the wisdom man said, no. That's not the worst thing that can happen. The worst thing that happens to a person is to set goals and have dreams and then achieve them. And, but only to come to the end of that journey and realize that they have given that life to an inferior person. 
no point. They should have given their life to something that does not, does, does not pay eternal dividend. And they're giving their life to something, maybe it is education, maybe it is position, maybe it is, it's, it's power, maybe it is prestige, or whatever it is, and never acquire a sound, strong, stable relationship with God. Never had their life led by an influence by the Holy Spirit. Are you listening to me over here? Yeah. So I go through life. And I can quote Shakespeare, let me not to the marriage of true mind. When you disgrace with fortune and man die. And no one ever did the walking down the roots. And I know all of that. And yet don't know the love of God that passes all understanding. Total depravity. Total depravity. Am I here? And he threatened on freezing. Status is not substance. I mean, he beat the boys who got so disgusted with this country and how they tried this, that, and they moved to Africa. And that's where he died. And I can learn, 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 learn. And yet not learn what it means to have a living home. That's, 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 that's what it happened. And, and, and uh, uh, totally private physical body. It might happen to me. To make oneself feel good. Well, the eyes did. Eyesight did get Hearing and terror. And some people to make themselves feel good, they die they have free. They die they have free. That way, that way, I escape putting that on me. Physically. You're affected. Huh? Somebody know when you know when you are really affected by by this when your back go out more than you. <laughs> I like to say that when, when Dixie has to call your house because they ran out of medicine and need to fill up the street. <laughs> That's what it so the cross confirmed the biblical teaching that man is totally depraved. I, 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 Okay, we have to do this lesson over because I want you to see the scripture. But let's look at uh, Romans 7 and 8. Look what Paul said. Let's read together. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, do I let no good thing, for the will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. And what he is saying here is not that this flesh, the blood, tissues, capillaries, and all of this stuff. Not that that, is, no, the, the, that part of him is, is evil. He's saying in me, that the principle of sin in us. That's what happened when Adam said the principle of sin uh, inhabit every individual. That the principle of sin in every human being. And Paul said it's that principle of sin that, I, that causes me problems. Why? Because, let me say, for to will is present. So that he wasn't saying that he is totally bad himself. He was saying that principle of sin is fighting against, bucking against the better part of him that wants to do good. And it's so powerful that it prevents me from doing what I want to do. I want to love. I want to forget. I want to go on. I want to overlook. The, 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 the wrong that is done. I won't be saying, but I'm having problems with this old principle of sin. Am I helping somebody? I got problems, he said. And, uh, let's look at Titus 1. Hold on, let me see something here. Uh, Let's look at Titus 1 and 15. Okay, so I want to say something else. So let's go back to. Okay. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwell no good thing. For the will is present, I want to. 
But how to perform that which is good, I'll find out. What I want you to see here, I want you to see Paul's connected uh, uh, theological error with practice. So what do you mean by all of that? Okay, look what he's saying. He's saying, even though I want to do good, I got my theology in practice. But I can't fulfill my theology. I want to do good. I can't fulfill my theology because I want to do good. That's right theology, but I'm doing wrong. That's bad practice. Somebody don't help Y'all can understand that. If theology is right, I want to do good. But there is a principle, there is something that opposes me. And because it opposes me, even though I got the right theology, I still have the wrong practice. How many of us got the right theology? We know we ought to love. We know we ought to forgive. We know we ought to do good. We know we ought to uh, live in harmony and unity. We know we ought to represent Jesus in all things. We know that we are all mem many members with just one body. Am I helping somebody? We all know that what we condemn sometimes in others, we allow something worse in ourselves. We all know that we all have sin and come short of the glory. We know it, but still we tell each other. Our theology is right. If you act the average Christian, do you? Do, and you think you ought to do good for people who do you wrong? Oh, yes, well, that's what Jesus did. Oh, your theology is right. But do we do it? Hmm? And so then, yes. Mm -hmm. What about God's favor upon us? Okay, if we know the theology is right, we know the theology. If we know what's right. Yeah. And we go contrary to that. And we go contrary to that. What about God's favor on us? What about God's blessing us? What, what about God just showing us favor and doing good for us? Well, right, so, right that's, a, that's a good observation. I will show you, show you that uh, later in more in depth. But it, it, it's so true. What we got to recognize, we see Paul talk about himself. Paul said, I talk with you now, others, Stephanus, Basil, Quill, and all those other, they were guilty too. Peter, he got up and didn't want to sit with the uh, 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 Gentiles, one of the Jews from Jerusalem came. But, but he, chose to choose, he chose to talk about himself. And each one of us got to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, how close is my practice to my theology? Now you got to answer that for yourself. The, the, the blessing about that is that your wife or your husband don't even have to know that you ask this question and they don't have to know the answer you give. That's <laughs> my you got, you got to be honest with ourselves. And Ferdinand got to ask himself, well, Ferdinand, are you practicing not what you preach, but are you practicing on the level Do your practice represent the level of your knowledge? The Bible say amen. I'm talking to me now. Ferdinand, do your practice represent the level of knowledge? If that, how, 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 how wide a gap is there between your deed and your creed? What is your motive? Do you take up your cross? Daily. And do you follow him? Follow him not only in the mountain, the mountain top, but follow him in places that you rather not go. I got to ask me that God. Do you do the, those things he commanded you to do? Not the easy stuff. But do you do the hard things? Those things that come against you. And those things that you are more vulnerable to not do. Am I helping somebody? Oh, if I tell you what, oh, I don't be lying. And then lying is right at that. I don't think you. 
I just don't, I don't, no, 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 no. We're not talking about, you see, the thing about comparing yourself, you will always compare yourself with the weaker person because you come out of the comparison looking good. And so when we, when we talk about and mention our, 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 our talk about ourselves, and if not we did, we will choose to say that we are not too watch it. I'm going to get you real quick. Self-denial. Jesus said, when you talk about picking up self, denying self, denying self, that means self-denial. Denying self. See, I can deny myself alcohol, but I don't drink it anyway. I can decide to deny myself cigarettes, but I never smoke. I try to. <laughs> and then one night on my way to lunch, and now I'm trying to smoke the cigarette. And I'm coughing, and, and then I say, for example, I walk in the lunch, I'm a young boy. For example, you fool. People are trying to get rid of it, you trying to pick it up. And I threw the pack away, and I would say, I know. You know. But, 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 and so then, I don't smoke. That, that ain't saying nothing. What about the things we are vulnerable to that gives us problems? Can we say, I don't do that, brother White? So, you know, I've, I've, I've been analyzing that voice uh, for a few minutes, and, and it seems to be, a, to me, a very serious voice because Paul called to our attention uh, two things that happened within our own uh, 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 body. Mm -hmm. He said that some bad things in your body. Mm -hmm. And number one, that bad thing is that old man, that old nature mm -hmm. that's in the body, mm -hmm. and it's still there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then he said they fighting over the mind, that's mm -hmm. the will, mm -hmm. okay? And if they're fighting over, over my mind, if Paul is having a problem with this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no, what about us? You know, he's having a serious problem. Uh, he, he said that the will is in my mind. Mm -hmm. I've got that desire, mm -hmm. but that's just something every now and then that just pushed me off base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, if that happens to Paul, mm -hmm. what about us? It's a good way to put it. It's a good, that's a good way to put it. And so then, what you did, you measured yourself against, I'm saying, you call us to measure ourselves, not against the weakest brother, but the strongest brother. And even, we got to go further than that. Even when I can say I'm like Paul, now the next thing I got to ask myself, if I like Jesus, he's talking to them. Do you love like Jesus? Do you face life like Jesus? Do you deal, make decisions like Jesus? Do you seek a relationship with your heavenly father like Jesus did? He is our example. Do you follow? So that's why when we measure ourselves according to the him or the way we're supposed to, we all have sins and come short of the glory of God. And the reason why some folks are stuck on themselves and can't see it that way, the reason why they're having a hard time dealing with an errant brother or a brother or sister with hurt them is because they have not seen themselves in the, through the eyes of Christ. Through the eyes of God. Because if you see yourself through the eyes of God, you know that your righteousness is like filthy. You know that it's nothing but the grace of God. You know that if it had not been for the Lord on your side, you would be prostitution out there. You would be under the bridge somewhere. You would be tearing up the world. It's God's grace, not your goodness. Mark the day he looked at the Look, Man said, there goes God, you're not but for the grace of God. That's what you can do every time. See that drop up, you can't hardly stand up. You can, there go God, but for the grace of God. You see that prostitute, that all out, out there, there go God, with the one for the grace of God. You don't hear what I'm saying? You see the folks, a lot of stuff, you saw those folks, I'm sorry, this past week, God got 50 some years because of uh, he's trying to shoot this two lane student. There go I. If not but for the grace of God. That's why we can claim glory for ourselves under no circumstances. We're all wretched creatures, miserable creatures, rebels clean away from God. 
You will see something. I'm not going to get to it. Okay, so let's go to Titus 115. Did we go down? Look what he said. He's talking about totally prophecy. Let's read together. Unto the fear, all things are fear. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, that's man in the natural state where you and I was at some particular time, nothing is pure. But even their mind and their conscience is defiled. Why? Because sin has affected negatively our entire being. We think we, 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 we think we're right when we're wrong. We, we, and then even when we're right, there's some aspect of our right that, that does not line up. We're not right in all of our details. Am I happy? I'm right when I say he did me that or she did me that, but I'm not right in my attitude to how I respond to what she did or what he did. And so in detail, I'm not right all the time, even though overall I might be right. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 It's like a car. It's like your car and my car. It's like somebody's car that got them here. Can you say that car is in 100% good shape? Your engine like might have came on with your stereo. But your car is not perfect, but it's functional. And you and I, we are functional and far from perfect. Far from being like Jesus. Dr. Gregory told us in Fort Worth when we were at his house studying during Paul Clement's plan, he said, preachers, he said, 10 minutes after we get to heaven, he said, we're going to be ashamed of how we preach this car. And he had before us, each one of us, he had a package before us and had the outline of the subject matter we were teaching. And he had it in Greek and he had it also in Hebrew. And I'm saying, if he says this, at the level in which he preached and understand, should not say the same thing. Do you hear what I'm saying? If the most noble Christian can say, oh, I'm less than the least. Well, I persecuted the church of God. But I, by the grace of God, I am what I am. If the most noble preacher, if the best product of the gospel, Paul was the best product, Jesus is the gospel, Paul was the greatest product of the gospel, if he can say that, what about you and I? Go and read the story. I've been beaten three times with rod in the sea, there the night, fought with beasts and Ephesus. I went through all of that. They let me down over the wall of the master because they wanted to kill me. They helped get me out of town. You and I, nobody ever shot at us yet, but not especially for not for witnessing. <laughs> and so let's look at Jeremiah's. See, see again, Jeremiah 17 and 9. Okay. Now, now, barely, uh, I want to uh, go to, Jer just situate yourself so you can give me Jeremiah 3. I'm sorry, Jeremiah 17, third verse through the fifth verse, I think it is. So that's all what we got there, but situate that because once that we do this, I want to go back to uh, Jeremiah uh, uh, 17, 3, 5. Okay, let's look. Let's read. Right. The heart is what? Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's man. That's you. That's me. It's like in our unregenerated state. The heart. The heart. The center of our emotion, our lives, when we make decisions, is deceitful above all things. And desperately, not just likely, but desperately, seriously, wickedness to the 25th degree. Wicked, not, not just bad, but wicked. That's the same thing as sinfulness, that's the same thing as iniquity, that's the same thing as wickedness. Wickedness. Okay, can you give me the third verse? I'm going to see if I'm, if I'm right. Got the third verse? Let me see something here. 
Okay. Okay, I'm going to read. I'm going to read the third, but I really won't get to the eighth, fifth through the eighth. Okay. Oh, oh, my mountain. Let's read together. Oh, my mountain in the field. I will give thy substance and all the treasures to the spoil and thy high places for sin throughout all thy borders. Fourth way. We will go before. Okay. And thou, even thyself, shall just continue from thine heritage. You know, we will go read it, but that's not what we get to. I give thee, and I will call thee to serve thine enemies. Okay, that's what he's sending them into uh, captivity because of their sin. In the land where thou knowest not, for you have kindled a fire in mine anger. You, have, you, have, you made me mad. We shall burn forever. Okay, now this is what I'm going to give you. Thus saith the Lord, write this out. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusted in man and make his flesh his own, and whose heart depart from the law. Thus be the man who depends upon himself and, and others and leave me out. Let's go back to the next one. For he shall be like he in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not in that. Next verse. Blessed is the man. Now you don't notice in the fifth verse he said, cursed is the man. Now, here you get to the seventh verse, he said, blessed is the man that trusted in the Lord, and who hope the Lord is. In this verse. For he shall be as a tree. Listen to it. The one trusting God. But God first, the one who leans on him, and the one who seeks to know him, and to yield and yield to him, and allow God to order his step and to guide him, regardless of what happens to him in life, no matter what, his eyes are not on man, his eyes are not on circumstances, his eyes are never toward the Lord, you want to please the Lord, because in pleasing the Lord, that man shall be blessed, he shall be as a tree planted by the water, and that spread it out of her roots by the river, and shall not see when he comes, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Thank you, Father. The difference between the cursed man, or the cursed person, and the obedient person. The cursed person uh, 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 will, will suffer. Uh, 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 cast, being cast away into a land that he knows not. In other words, it's going to be, it's going to be tumultuous. But the blessed man, uh, the, 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 the blessed man, the one who obeys, uh, obedience. So that's what we're dealing with. Disobedient, obedience. So disobedience is going to have these things happen. The obedience is going to have these things happen. It should be like a tree planted by the river of the wall. Now, go, go to nine months. Tell you what has happened. Go to the ninth place. And okay, okay, okay. Look, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know what Isaiah is saying? Isaiah is saying, is saying, look, we, we, we've been told, we've been shown, shown that if you disobey God, these kinds of things are going to happen. But if you obey God, you're going to be blessed, you're going to be like a tree. And he said, but the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can, who can, what do you guys mean? Who can understand a person making the choice to disobey God, making the choice to live out of flesh, making the choice to trust in the arm of man in the military when God has specifically and plainly said, when you do that, you're going to have some hard trials and tribulations and, 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 and you're going to have a rough time in life. But if you obey God, Isaiah is saying that it's Jeremiah, brother. It's so simple. If you do this, this is what's going to happen to you. But if you do this, this is what's going to happen to you. Then why in the world do you choose to do wickedly? He said, and so here's the answer. The answer is you do wickedly because the heart is deceitful. Why? Why, folks? Why do they tear down? Why are they unforgiving? Because their heart is deceitful. Yeah. Why do they reject Christ? Why do they put down on, 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 on Christ in this church? 
Why did they kick Brown out of school? Why did they, uh, uh, that was an attempt to remove everything that is sacred? Because their heart is deceitful. And here's our politician trying to pass laws to straighten this out. There's no law that can pass that can straighten out a deceitful heart. That heart needs Jesus. That heart needs God. And so then, who can know it? <laughs> wow, who can know? Who can, under, in other words, who can understand a person, who can understand people who have the word of God right at their disposal, have of the word of God taught to them, plainly, and the word of God uh, that would help them have understanding and to deal with the issues of life, but yet they don't come, they stay alone. Who can know it? Who can know it? Who can know it? Go to 10 words. Go to 10 words. Who can know it? You see who can know it? The Lord search the heart. We can't know our own heart. We can't know the heart of us. We can't know why we are so mean sometimes. We are so selfish sometimes. We are so unforgiving sometimes. We can't know it, but Jeremiah answers the question. He said, I love the Lord answered the question for Jeremiah. He said, I the Lord. I know what's the problem. I search the heart. I try to reign. Even to give every man according to his way and according to the fruits of his doing. So he said, I check well, I, what he does. He said, I check out the heart. Come on here. We check out, you check out the diction and the transition. Well, it is freaking smooth transition from point A to point B. You check out the explanation of the scripture. You check out the demonstration of the scripture the, or the illustration of the scripture. And then you check out the application of the scripture. But God said, I check the heart. So you, you, you say, my, this red pretty. And God said, I take the heart out. I know the heart. I know the motives. I, I know whether what is being done is done solely acceptably for my glory. Or is it done to be for self-aggrandizement, self-promotion, and self-elevation. Am I having some time? Oh, God, you so mad. Why would you not let me get right back on it? And you held your note for a long time. God said, that's all right. I'll check out the heart. And then when you go home and laugh at somebody who struggled to a song, God had been saved well done because he checked out the heart. We judge the outside. God knows the inside. I'm preaching, y'all. So, so, so what, what, what is this for? It is for you to examine your motive. It is for you to determine what means most to you. It is for you to know not just you came physically and you come physically to church on Sunday or physically to Bible class on Wednesday. It is for you to know why are you coming. Are you coming with the aim of applying what you learn to your life? And based in your life on what you hear, or, or you're just coming to acquire intellectual uh, uh, knowledge satisfaction so that you can say, well, I know, listen, you can quote some scripture and you can uh, quote some phrases, uh, but, but are you here because you believe that the word of God can impact your life, bring about transformation in your heart, and cause you to live the way God wants you? That's what it's all about. Not what people think. What people say is about God knowing the heart, trying to reign. Yes. Yes. It's about it affecting you so much and affecting you to the point. Now, you go home and you apologize if you need to. And you try to get matters straight with you and your brother or sister. You go back to your job. And say, you know what? I haven't been representing Jesus like I really should. Am I helping somebody in this place? Huh? 
Oh Lord, let me tell you what I want you to do. What I'm telling you to do, that the husband and wife, boyfriend and girlfriend, whatever the case is, you have uh, devotion every morning. Every morning. Have devotion. If you're single, you by yourself, have devotion with yourself. Every morning. Don't you dare have to do it. Now, you might have to do a little something for it. You might have to catch it uh, uh, a little later during the day, but make sure you do it. You might have to do something. This said makes such a difference. Let me tell you, uh, the Lord showed me, uh, showed me some things, and uh, I want to be in His will at all times. I want to do what He wants me to do. I want to treat people the way He wants me to treat them. And so my wife and I, let's say, we talk about that kind of every morning. I'm going to do it this morning, tomorrow morning, you're going to do it. And then we won't well, we say, talk about the scripture, not talk about we're going to read it, so I'll pass the scripture, then we're going to pray together. All right. It makes you strong. Yes, it does. Yes, it right. helps you. Yes. It lifts yes. you above. Yes. And it's yes. tough. Yes. You don't hear what I'm saying. Yes. Yes. You need help. And Paul says, we've got no good thing. In him, God no good thing. In me, God no good thing. In you, God no good thing. We need an antidote. We need strength. We need power. We need somebody that can overcome, help us to overcome our sinful tendency. So, starting that day off with meditation and prayer, it set the tone for the whole day. Am I have to tell you? Yes, yes. Okay, so Ephesians, do we have Ephesians 4 18 now? So that's what? Ephesians 4 and 18. Hmm? We had that? No, we have to do it. Okay. Okay, I didn't give you that last uh, those uh, two scripts I want. That's what I had in number two? Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's move on. Uh, why the cross? The cross demonstrates both the love and the justice of God in perfect unity. The cross. Why the cross? The cross demonstrates the perfect unity of love and justice. The love and justice of God in the cross. You see God's love and you see, do y'all hear that? You see God's love and you see God's justice. At this highest level, both at the highest level. You're going to like this. It demonstrates both the love and the justice of God in a perfect unity. God just as much love as he is just, and he just as much just as he is love. In my head, that's about it. Now, justice of God, here it is. In the Hebrew, there is only one word for justice and righteousness. So when the Bible says just, God is just and God is righteous. In any, there are two words, righteousness and justice. Am I helping somebody? Well, in English, English is righteousness in, uh, forget about all that. The point of emphasis is that it demonstrates both the love and the righteousness of God of the love and the justice of God. It's perfect unity. That makes sense. Let's go to Romans 14. Having an understanding, Dr. You see, really, I put it in the wrong place because this has to do, again, with total depravity. depravity. So pass that one up, pass the next scripture up, and go on to whatever you have need. And so the day in the flesh cannot please God, that's total depravity. Now go on to the next thing. Okay, so now 1 John 4 and 10. Here it is, love. The cross shows God's perfect love, and it shows God's perfect justice. Do you hear me? It shows God's perfect love, a perfect, perfect love, and it shows God's perfect righteousness, a perfect justice. Do y'all, am, am I losing? Y'all understand me? Okay, so, look what John said, for John 4 and 10. Here in this love, in other words, you want to know what love is? You want an idea of what love really looks like? You want to know love at its best, at its granule, at its, its deepest? Here in this love, 
Not that we love God. There was nothing good about you and nothing good about me that motivated God to express love for you and I. We, we, we were creatures totally undeserving of God's love. He said, this is what love is. Love is God loving us even though we don't deserve it. And loving us, not strictly in word, but demonstrating that love by sending his son to be the propitiation for our sin. That word propitiation, uh, halasmian, means that uh, it's a sacrifice. God sent his son to sacrifice. The sacrifice for you and I. To be a sacrifice for you and I. Here in his love. Not that we love God, but God loved us so much. He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. He sent his son to die for our sins that we might have fellowship with him. It might happen tonight. God's love. And so what you see here is that God's love is self-giving. He gives. Here in his love. Love is not about receiving so much as it is giving. Giving. You basically, we look for something, we look to get something from a relationship. And we measure, am I getting as much as I'm putting out? Help me out. But, but John said, if you really want to know what love is, love is giving. And then, then he gave his son when we didn't deserve it. We couldn't never deserve it. So love is sacrificial giving. You give to your mate. You give to your uh, uh, You give. You give. And, 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 and love does not de uh, 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 determine how much it gives on the basis of how much it has received. Well, he does everything I want. He does everything I want. So I, that's the least I can do for him. That's not love. That, that's crazy. <laughs> you love and you give when you don't deserve it. And your love got to be predicated upon God's love for you. Your love for others got to be predicated on God's love for you. And so then when you look at God's love for you, he loves you in spite of, and so then you have love others in spite of. Yes. But that old man, Adam, is there, sent for nature is there, to hinder you from loving like you want to love. You should love, and you have to recognize that. So that's why you got to draw nearer to God, and nearer to God. You got to give yourself to him. You have to look beyond and above what circumstances are, what people are doing, how they relate to you. You have to think in terms of, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like you in my heart. Because the highest joy and the highest peace that I can ever experience is by being walking in the will of God. And I want to be in your will. And when you're in the will of God, no, Jesus said, the joy I give to you, the world cannot take that joy away. No man take it your joy. And so you, you want a joy that is unaffected and uninterrupted by human beings. Amen. And by circumstances, let the storm breathe. Let the wind blow. Let the rain fall. Let them reject me. Let them find fault. You want a love that will, and you get that love, and walk in that love, and he'll lift you above all of that stuff. You won't find yourself getting on here because wherever, wherever I couldn't sleep last night. That big group say thing to me, I was so mad I could have smacked it. Well, when you get the love of God in your heart, you don't want to smack nobody. <laughs> if you still want to smack somebody, you want to choke somebody, except the men that what the grace of God has not lifted you and has not worked in your heart to the point that you're lifted above such foolishness. I thought I thought to tell them a piece of my mind. That means you still in control. But when God is in control, His grace enables you to turn the other cheek. Go to your extra mile. It enables you to do good for those who despitefully use you. And you want peace. You don't worry about how you look what people are going to think and how they feel. You do it because you want to. You feel that that's the, that's the least I can do. 
for the one who loved me so unselfishly and so unconditionally. I'm teaching you. Am yeah. I helping somebody? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it said uh, love, but also it said justice, which is righteousness. God's righteousness, by the way. God's righteousness. You know what God's righteousness means? God's righteousness means that God always, not sometimes, not most times, not a good bit of time, but God always acts in accordance with what is right. And is himself the final standard of what is right. You want to know what is right? You got to look at God. You want to know what is right? You got to look at Jesus. If you want to know what's right, you got to listen to God. You got to listen to him. He tells you what's right. It's right to love. It's right to forgive. It's right to go to your brother if he arm against you and seek to get his strength. It's right to love and love your wife as Christ said. It's not right for the wife to submit to her husband. It's right for us to raise up our children in the nurture of the Lord. It's right for children to obey God. It's right for us to give our 10% tithe and plus our offering. It's right to walk circumspectly in the world. It's right to deny ourselves and take up a cross and follow him. It is right to pray in Jesus' name. It is right to knock the door going to be open. It's right to ask. It's right to seek. It is right to take off every weight and sin that so easily beset us and run the race with patience. Get in a hurry. Run the race with patience. It's right to do that. God is always right. God is the standard of Christ. And anything that is contrary to that is not we fail to emulate God. It might happen somehow. So we're going to the next thing. Romans, but God commended his love toward us saying the same thing in that while we were no good. That's what yet sinners mean, no good. It is also mean low down, fanatic. Sure. Yes, yes. Good for nothing. That's what it means. Yes. <laughs> While we were good for nothing, Christ died for us. Yes. Now, if that's the case, is it too hard to try to be like him? Is he asking too much? He's not asking us to do what he did in degrees. He asking us to be like him in kind. You understand? Mm -hmm. That's actually too much. Mm -hmm. God been given a life sentence in prison, hard labor. Somebody walk up to him. Or the judge called him and say, look, I know yesterday I sentenced you. But you know what? I'm going to commute your sentence. Or the president commute your sentence. What I need you to do is come and move my law. Is that asking too much? Consider what the judge have, have done. Is it asking too much for you to present your body as a living sacrifice? Is it acting too much for you to walk under the influence or live under the influence of the saints of God? That's what you got to look at. And if you don't look at it that way, you will have some problems. If you look at life and you regulate your life on the basis of circumstances and people, then you will miss the whole thing about life. But focusing on him will enable you to rise above yes. any stupidity, foolishness, craziness. Yes, Lord. When you look at him. But you got to stop thinking about how you're going to look in the eyes of man and stop thinking about how you're going to look in the eyes of God. So, so, so let's 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 look at let's look at that. Yes, look at Deuteronomy 32 and 4. Did you have that feeling? Yeah, 32 and 4. Look, let's read together. He is the rock. His work is perfect. God's work is perfect for all His ways. Not some, not most, not many, not a good bit. All His ways are judgment. He is a God of truth. Without any iniquity, just and right is he. He's always right. God is always right. And if you think about that, God is always right. It'll hold on your anger. 
your bitterness, your, you, you want to let people and things irritate you. But God is always right. And all of these things I mentioned, bitterness, anger, and, and animosity, and malice, is not in his character. So therefore, they cannot be a reflection of your position. Well, that's a position. Your position in Christ. See, when you are saved, you're placed in Christ. That's your position. That's one thing. You can't ever get out of Christ. But now you're placed in a position to function. So when I was installed as pastor, I was placed in a position, but not just to sit down. I have to function in that capacity. And so God placed you in Christ. That's your position. The Spirit placed you in Christ. But he placed you there for purpose. To function like Jesus. He begged to put you there. He, 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 God gave you his spirit so that his spirit can work through you to uh, bring about a duplication, so to speak, of Jesus. Jesus is not here physically to love his enemy and to do good and, his, uh, uh, and to feed the hunger, the hungry. So he plays you in Christ, the spirit of God is in you, so that you can now reproduce the ways of Christ. But you can't do it in your own strength. You need the spirit to do it through you. So how do I let the Spirit do it? You got to reckon yourself to be dead to sin, to the power of sin, and then not yield yourself. You got to just stretch out on me and say, I'm yours. Take my life. Use it for your glory. Now, you understand that I understand, Lord, that I'm going to fuck sometimes. You understand that I'm going to uh, uh, sometimes get a little louder. But, but, but I'm asking you, even when I fuck, when I get loud, I'm asking you, don't give up on me. But just deal with me. Whatever you have to do, do it until you get me back in line. You got to chastise me, chastise me. You got to put me down on my back, put me down on my back. You got to take away my suffering, my children, and my, my cows, and my health, and you call my wife to go crazy. Let it happen to me. Because I want to be what you want me to be. Because I know if I hold on and do what you want me to do, I, I know that in the end, you're going to give me twofold of yeah. what I have. Yeah, God bless the faithfulness. Help him. Somebody say faithfulness. Faithful. God bless his faithfulness. If you're faithful, you might have to suffer. You might have to cry. If you're faithful, you might hurt. But God will reward you in due season. Not suffer the righteous to be moved. And when the righteous go through the valley and shadows of death, I'll be there with them. My rod and my staff shall comfort them. I lead them beside still water. And I restore their soul when it becomes lean and weak. Thank you, Lord. That's what he calls it. That's what he calls Okay. Let's go to uh, uh, number three. Number three. What is that? Propitiation? I'm sorry. Salvation comes from the fear, sovereign grace of God. Salvation comes from the fear, sovereign grace. Look at Romans 3, 23, 24. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus. It is because of Jesus you are saved. Yeah. It's because of Jesus I am saved. Well, well, I know the Lord because you pass a long time and you preach the word, you've been teaching the word all your life. And you're 13 years old. And no, I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus did. Yeah. It's by the grace of God. And if my destiny, our eternal destiny, your eternal destiny is dependent upon what you, the good you do, or what God will do about the bad stuff you do. You know what happened? You're going to spend six months in heaven, and then you got to go back and spend six months in hell. You go back, and back and forth. Because something has to be done with sin. Hopefully I can show you that tonight. And so then, might be able to do about seven minutes, okay. And so then, uh, salvation is from, I'm sorry, 
is the pure sovereign grace of God. Now, now listen what I want to say about, about that. Salvation is the pure sovereign grace of God. Listen, we talk about God's mercy. God's mercy is God's goodness toward those. God's mercy is God's goodness toward those who are miserable and in distress. If you want to get a hold of what God's mercy is, God's mercy is God's goodness to those who are miserable, are in misery, and distress. It just, it can't get it. The thing falling apart, falling apart, apart. I'm hurting, my heart is heavy, aching, because of a child, because of children, or because of my own sin, whatever it is, miserable. God's mercy is God's goodness toward those who are in misery or distress. God's grace, God's grace is God's goodness Toward those who don't deserve it. Am I helping you? God's goodness, God's grace is God's goodness toward those who deserve it. I'm sorry. To, toward those who deserve it. Right. God's grace is God's goodness toward those. God being good toward those who really deserve punishment. Well, where do you mean to tell me that a person can do all of that and then in the end, Talking about how believe, and that's all I is to it. God's grace is God's goodness toward folks who deserve punishment. Yeah. And when you're talking about them, and they just come at the last minute and talk, just remember this you deserve the same thing. Yeah. And then God's patience. God's patience is God, not, uh, uh, is God's goodness in withholding punishment from those who actually deserve it. Right there and now. Another word saying, God's patience is God's goodness toward those who have been who been in sin for a long, long time. Yeah. Or even a short time. That's the patience. Those who, whose great spirit just have found out a long time ago. God's patience. It's what Peter said, God is not slack concerning his promise to us, what? but is long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the God's patient. Do you know why Ferdinand has not been cut down yet? What better than God look at me? Do you know why you have been cut down? Do you know why you still, been all these years, months, still doing and saying some of this old stuff? Still judging others when you allow stuff in your own life? It's God's patience. Patience is his goodness toward us. Even though we could have and should have been wiped out years and years ago. Am I happy? Okay. I know you wanted to see that. So that's why I showed it. Let's look at number four. The believer can be secure in the grace of God. Go to the scripture. I need about five more minutes. I can get to where I want to go. About. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that what? That sent me, go on. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing if you in Jesus, if you don't lose no salvation. But should raise it up again at the last day, as the day comes. Hmm? When the shop the trouble. And all that stuff going to take place. And the saints who have slept in him or sleep in him go run with him, God. And the day comes when the day ain't right. Don't get up. Shake off the grave clothes. It might happen to somebody. Step out of the tomb and move on. And we're going to be caught up. You see, when he come back to the rapture, he's going to stop in midair. It might happen to somebody. And then we're going to be caught up but, 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 and, 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 and with him. And forever we'll be with the Lord, right? But then after seven years of tribulation, uh, he's coming back. Yeah. When he comes to the church, he's going to stop in mid -air. But when he comes back the second time, it might help us somebody. Yeah, you see, when he came here the first time through uh, the manger, he had on his pleading clothes. 
Come unto me. And when you come back the second time, you're going to have one of the judgment moments. And you're going to call all this stuff together. It might happen to somebody. Revelation said, you will still to let it remain there. It's going to be too late. Huh? We want to go back with him. And I have it to my children. So, so let's go number five. We are motivated, not just in that, such great salvation that came at such great cost. He's saying this salvation came at a great cost. I mean, if you think about it, what, what it costs God, it costs you money, but what it costs God to deliver you and I. Yeah. Okay, let's look at these scriptures and close out with it. I want you to see it. Romans 8, is that Romans 8? Okay, let's, let, let's go to uh, Romans, Romans 3, right? I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, that's Roman number two. Yeah, right. I got it. Mm -hmm. Let's 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 read this. Let's read. Uh, we're gonna do this right quick. Give me four minutes, okay? Let's read. I was to call you three times in this passage that reflect the work of Christ. Okay, move on. But now the righteousness of God, without the law, is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Go on. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, but there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory. Somebody say all. all. Somebody say we. we. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation sacrifice through faith, atonement, that is, through faith, in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sin that are passed through uh, the forbearance of God. Go on. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believe in Jesus. So we see redemption. Redemption bears the idea of one who is a slave and who is free. So when we say Jesus redeemed us, we were slaves to sin. Jesus brought us back, brought us back out of slavery. Go on to the next one. Justification. A forensic job is a term of the court. And he used in the court, Jesus' death declared us not guilty. We are guilty, but his death declared us not guilty. When God gave Jesus and Jesus died on the cross, God, Jesus justified us, the word justified men, to declare righteous, even though we're not righteous. He declared us righteous. God has declared you and I righteous. That's why we can shout. That's why we can, because that's why we don't have to hang our head down when we sin or when we fall short. We go to the throne of grace. That's why we can rejoice in spite of the fact. That's why I can preach and others can preach, even though we are not sinless ourselves. Because God has declared us righteous. It's me on account of, not on account of us being righteous, but he has declared us righteous on account of what Jesus did. Because of what Jesus did, we are declared righteous. Go on to the next time. Perpetuation. Can't get word to It means, it really doesn't translate us as the sacrifice of atonement. Jesus gave except to mean perpetuation is to be that he he, he, he uh, became a sacrifice. He uh, told me the same thing to uh, to to, to uh, appease the wrath of God by a sacrifice, like to free us from slavery. In other words, God wanted to free us from slavery, but what He did, He gave Jesus to die on the cross. Now let me tell you something right quick. Uh, statement: The condition of salvation are very clear in the Scripture: repentance and faith. Repentance means a change of the mind in a deeper manner, a change in one's heart, mind, and what? And purpose. Okay, now go back to, uh, let me see, go back to, 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 to three. Let's look at, but, uh, I'm sorry, go back to Romans 3 and 21st verse. But now the righteousness, right this, I'm going to explain this to you right quick. But now, but now, right now, the, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Go on to the next one. 
even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all that believe, but there is no difference. Go on to the next one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Next one. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Next one. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. That's it. Whom God has set forth to be a sacrifice through faith by the blood of Jesus. And God in so doing declared his righteousness for the remission of sin, forgiveness of sin, that are passed through the forbearance of God. Okay, let me explain that right quickly. This is what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, and he's going back to the Old Testament. You remember that the brain bullocks and, 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 and pigeons and all that stuff? And, and, and people sin. But the Bible says, like Peter said in the day of Pentecost, at the time of their ignorance, God went there. In other words, he didn't punish them for their sin. The animal died. God didn't punish them for their sin. And so Paul is saying, now we're going to be those who say, well, I understand God is love because he took care of us. But how can you say God is just because God didn't require uh, human sacrifice for sin back in the Old Testament? This is what Paul is saying here in the 21st verse. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. What Paul is saying that there are those of you who will say God is not just, God is not righteous, because God said in Ezekiel, the soul that sin shall die, and no man die for sin, for sin. He said, but here it is. At the time, in the Old Testament, he said, God delayed, God Overlooked, God put on hold. He said, but now in these days, yeah. he said, Christ has come. You see what he said, righteousness for the remission of sins that are past? He said, all the past sins back there in the Old Testament. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. He said, God has taken care. You say, God is not righteous because he didn't require a, a, a blood sacrifice back there? He said, God just was putting that, God put that on hold. God just was buying some time. He had his own time fixed. To what? To fulfill his righteousness through death. And so then, I showed my love back there then, but now I show my righteousness because I said, the soul that sin shall die, I said that there must be a blood sacrifice for sin. I'm the one said that uh, I will forgive sin. And now I'm making it good. I'm making good on my word. Look at the Lamb of God. And there are people who would think, because it hasn't happened yet. Some of them are going to say, according to Peter, where is the problem? Because since the world began, many been saying Christ is coming back and all this stuff. It hasn't happened yet. It's the same thing it said with Noah. Oh man, you got to be up 120 years, you're working on the ship. Now there's no flood coming. And so they both folks say, well, God ain't righteous because he hasn't done anything yet. And some, some today say, uh, I don't believe all that about the Bible because after all, I can look and see people don't give God a prayer. And they say, I don't want to be Christian. Look at Trump. Look at him. They stay in church. But God got all kinds of trouble with their children. Everything falling apart in their life. They're always in the doctor's office. You tell what kind of God is that? who let the wicked prosper and cause his own children to suffer. God saying, just hold on. I said, why did the Lord God got the key to this? The Bible said, uh, uh, one day with the Lord is like a thousand years. Not one day with the Lord is a thousand years. One day with the Lord is a thousand years. You have 365 days in a year. And so you multiply 365 times 1,000. <coughs> multiply 365 days times 1,000. And that is just like one day to love God. In other words, one day is like an eternity with God. So, so, so not down on the positive, negatively, but I close now. But positively too. Maybe that happened to you. Or you. Maybe you've been praying. Maybe you've been waiting. Maybe you've been doing the best you can. You got out of that group. You give up certain things. And you're trying to live right now. And put down some of your habits. And look like, as you say, look like when I stopped doing this, it look like all the hell broke out. Look like I was better off. That's the Satan trying to get you to go back into your foolishness. 
Because you remember, if you were satisfied in that foolishness, you wouldn't want to get out in the beginning. So if you got out, it simply meant that it wouldn't fulfill it, your deepest need. Yeah. But that go wrong. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Hold on. Your deliverance is on its way. Hold on. Don't turn loose. Some glad moment. When this life is over, I'll fly away. And so, God bless you tonight, and the Lord keep you. The grace of God is sufficient to provide for us in all our needs. Let us remember having met you and my family in our prayer. They feel a lot of sister on the morrow in New Orleans. And there are some others who are ill. Give them a call. Do whatever you can. My desire to see us come closer together. To see us. And I know relatively large congregation, we can't learn it, know everybody, but uh, you can learn, you can know, you can know more people than what you know. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, so, so to, to, the joy of life, let us think, the joy of life is, is giving ourselves to the service of God. That's joy. That's where it comes from. That's, that's where your joy comes from. Serve being a servant like Christ was. And maybe one tonight, God has spoken to you. You can come and say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, give yourself fully to you. God has spoken to you. On this coming Saturday night, body, God, Pastor Benjamin Scott's son will be ordained. Services began at 5 o'clock. Might want to share all of our prayer. Make no mistake about it. I thank God you gravitate one to another. I, I thank God for you. Appreciate you.
Amen. 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 Amen.